Hello, and welcome to the Disable the Label podcast. I'm your host, Kerry, and on our podcast, we'll be chatting about all things disability, holidays, equipment, therapy, funding, you name it, and we'll talk about it. We want to empower and support parents of disabled children across the UK whilst they navigate their child's life. So, what are we waiting for? Let's get into it. This podcast is sponsored by Savage Gymwear. Their belief in being the best of you is their core value and mission to bring quality gymwear to make everybody feel good about themselves. If you want to find out more about Savage Gymwear, check out our app, Disable the Label, and use DTL10 for 10% off your purchase. On today's podcast, we have Mike Paul from Walk This Way Global. He's come to chat everything about SDR therapy and therapy for disabled kids. So let's get into it. This is part two of Mike's podcast. So if you missed part one, head back over and listen to the first episode. Do you know how many, I, I I would say I've always told any parent that I've already been working with, like, I don't know what you would say on this, but SDR isn't just about just that operation afterwards. It's about what you do before as well that can help post. Massively. Pre to post is yeah. key. If you you know, the stronger you are before the operation, the faster you're going to get a result afterwards. And I have a theory on it as well. And, I, and I'm and i more than happy for everybody out there that's done the clinical trials and the clinical research to say that I'm completely wrong. But here's my theory on it. I believe that everybody moves at the same percentage increase. So I think that what SDR does is it hits a reset button almost. And if you were walking before SDR, you will be able to be running or walking better or walking more or doing more. But the percentage that you increase is the same for you as it is for the child that wasn't walking before that then learns to start to walk after it. And I feel that in the majority of the people that I work with, the percentage increase is more or less the same. I think everybody progresses the same amount. It's just where your start points are to where your start points to where your end point goes to. I think everybody has the ability with SDR to progress. And I get a lot of people that come in here that are, you know, very ambulatory. And there's a kid I worked with in, in America last time who was doing like amazing stuff, like hopping on one leg from one wobble cushion onto another. Now, a lot of the martial artists that wow. I work with are struggling with that. Right? I know. Three SDR, and the parents like. So oh wow! I know. Three. Wow! I, I know, and I was like, <laughs> okay. It's like this is amazing, and everyone's like, "Oh, you yeah. shouldn't have SDR." And I was like, "Well, you know, he's five, six years old. He's getting a little bit of a foot drop. He's got the tone coming into the gastroc. As your child has got more to lose." than someone that isn't walking with regards to he could lose a, a bit of the ability to walk as well as he is as he gets tighter or, or you know, mm-hmm. speak to someone, T.S. Park, and see what he thinks, you know, and see whether or not he thinks it would be beneficial. And the argument is that any spasticity is a bad spasticity, where a lot of the time we hear spasticity is your strength. By strength definition, you can't turn it on and off. So how can it be your strength? So yeah. for me, spasticity, and I'm not a physio, I'm not pretending to know all the answers, but for me, if you can turn a muscle on, but you can't turn it back off again, that's not really a strength. That's not a usable function, is it? Um, mm. You know, it's, you, it, you've got to be able to turn it on and turn it off and have control. And if you can't do that, then is that really a usable strength? Probably not. So I suppose where I'm at with it is that this child's probably going to have SDR. And what we're doing is looking for the future 10 years. As he grows, as he gets tighter, as this happens, as that happens, what's the ability of him to lose? And I've been doing it now about 13 years. And I've seen the kids that have been very ambulatory, that have started to lose their ambulation. And I've got one kid that I work with now who the dad and the kid could not work harder. Like, they are amazing. They work so, so hard. Um, And, you know, Mark and Julian, they they rock it. And I have to say, 
he's now toe walking really badly. He's starting to turn in the knee. He's losing his ability to balance and walk as well. And now they're, we're at the point of where they're having SDR, but it's taken so long in the UK to get there because we sit there and we almost say, well, yeah. the child's walking, so what's the point? They're not looking at the fact of what they could lose. And that's the thing that I, I struggle with a little bit is, is that I'm looking at what they could lose, not just what they can gain. And we all have to do that. And, yeah. I, and this kid's amazing, but he works so hard just to maintain, and, and he's never maintaining. He's losing. So as I said to this client, I was like, you don't know what's happening 10 years down the line, so get it as young as you can, have the operation, remove any spasticity that you can, and you're less likely to lose anything that you've currently got. So go for it. And you know what? Yeah. I think they're, they've, they've already met TS Park, and I think they're going to have the operation because – I, I believe they are now thinking down the same line. What are we going to lose um, more than what we're, yeah. what we're probably going to gain from having the op? So, it, yeah, I, I, it's an interesting one, I suppose. I've kind of rambled a little bit there, but it's it's a problem that yeah, I struggle nice. with, and you probably hear it quite a lot here, is that, you know, spasticity is their strength, and they're using their spasticity to walk on, and they're doing this, and they're doing that, and you're like, yeah, so. Or if we remove the spasticity, they'll be so weak, they'll not be able to do anything. So that's our job as therapists is to get them as strong as they possibly can pre-op. So then post-op, they can do it. But pre-op training and no-op training is more or less the same. We should be doing the same strengthening if they're having SDR or they're not. So we should be looking at their mm-hmm. strengths and their weaknesses and seeing what they can and what they can't do and trying to balance it off anyway. Um, yeah. So it's... It's a different thing. What, what about you? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Feel free yeah, to disagree. no, I totally, I know, I totally agree. I, I, th- I think what I found was a lot of parents were like, okay, we're going to stop therapy. We're going to go and have SDR. And I, and I would, you know, as much as I could say, that would be the worst idea to do, not to have SDR, to, to stop therapy before you're having SDR. Like, because, and I think, I don't know, I don't know why that is I, I kind of guess from i suppose sometimes the way the media has portrayed sdr uh, they've been convinced that this is their miracle cure that their child's going to walk and as you and i both know it's not just about the child's going to walk after sdr it's about what the child is able to do and is and all the work that you do before and after and and then continue on for the rest of their life like you know if if we if either one of us wanted to get a six pack we would have to work hard and then if we stopped that work we would lose our six pack and and i would say it's, it's the same thing you know and um so i had a lot of pushback from parents who then had watched something and said oh we're gonna get sdr it's gonna be amazing we're just gonna pause on therapy and i and i would just be like explain to them why that's not good and and the fact that you need that that pre sdr and i would even be if a parent came to me i would say right i would actually then pass them on and say like go and see mike or go and see whoever wherever they are in the in the country go and see this person because actually you really need to have really focused somebody that knows even more than i do about sdr because i'm not somebody that knows a lot obviously i don't i don't most of my kids just have cerebral palsy don't necessarily go and have sdr um and so you need that you need somebody who's who specializes in in that and that can help you pre and post and like and also for me in the uk i'm also making them aware like you need to however much money you think you need to raise it's going to be more than that because you need that therapy to continue for a lot longer than you think that you do and you know and also it's not just about the work that so i think we've got a lot in. better in the uk Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think we've got a lot better in the UK with, with regards to the way the, the information coming from the hospitals to the, to the, to the patient as well. Um, and I'm glad that it seems to be more able to get the operations, which is great. Mm-hmm. But um, I am a big St. Louis fan, not because they trained me, they nurtured me, they helped me. I'm a big St. Louis fan because the information that the, the parent comes away with tends to be more... Because you're there in that bubble for six weeks or eight weeks. You can see the therapist all the time. You can ask Mm -hmm. all the questions. You can see the progress from point A to point B. You can see everything. You're there. Everyone's on tap. Your splints come out perfect. Your therapy's great. 
you're seeing the process from start to finish. You've got the doctor there that does the surgery, that, that guides every process through it. And although you were doing that in the UK as well, they've done 5,000 of these in St. Louis. It's a machine. They understand all the mm -hmm. process coming through now. And the, the, it's like when a lot of my parents come in to me and they go, oh, you know, my child's not walking. And I say, it's not walking yet. You know, we will probably get your child to take independent steps by the end of this course. And you sit there and they're like, how can you possibly do that? And then on day two or day one, Sometimes I'll get the kids to take an independent step or three, and the parents are like, how is that possible? Just by niggling the muscle and making it connect and work and getting a break, that's what they do because they've done so many of it. They understand it, and this is part of the problem. It's not anything derogatory towards the UK. We do a great job. The, the surgeons here are fantastic. The physios here are great, but the mindset is also slightly different. We, we don't like to do the operation on somebody that's already walking or walking quite well because sometimes our answer will be the user's plasticity is their strength or we'll have a kid that's um in a wheelchair and they'll say well they're not going to see a massive benefit from it they will see a benefit from it because they might be able to use sticks or use a walker who knows and it's it's the mindset is different towards it and it's not me pooping the uk and this could completely backfire, but I don't care. Um, but it is slightly <laughs> different and the, because they've done slightly more of them, so their mindset is different. They've got more experience to pull from, um, mm. and, and that's important. But we don't seem to take into consideration the experience that the St. Louis Jones Hospital have at doing it and use the research and everything coming from there as a, as a thought process. It, it's like we almost use it like a beating stick or we say something like, He'll take on anyone. He doesn't take on anyone. If they're not strong enough, if they're not fitting the parameters, he won't take them on. But we don't see that. The other problem we have is tendon lengthening here. We wait until the kid has got so tight oh. and so, so many malformations into joints. And whereas in the US, I'll go and say to one of my USA clients, um, I think we need to speak to one of the ortho guys and see if they think that he would be suitable or really would be suitable for tendon lengthening. And then they do the appraisal and they say, yeah, we think he would. And I'm like, great, fantastic. Because you know that it's going to have a progression forward. But again, we've done so few of these operations with SDRs in the UK that they don't have the information to pull from. And we're still set in our ways in a lot of ways with the NHS that we're not looking outside of the box. And, yeah. you know, again, I could get absolutely slated for this, but that's OK. Um, but in the USA, they'll say no in the UK. I will go to Dr. Dobbs or I'll go to Dr. Yang and I'll say, client A presents with X, Y and Z. Here's all the videos. Here's all the information. What do you think? And they'll come back and they'll say, yeah, we could see why you would say that. Um, maybe not just now, but keep an eye on it in the future. And you're like, great. Most of the time, they come back and they say, yes, they can see why the X, Y, and Z is happening because of those tightnesses and because of that. And look at the foot, look at the knee position, the hips coming out, all these things. So if we have the operation now, it means that we can work on getting all the engagement. We're not building up that negative pattern that we love to talk about all the time. And we're allowing their body to move freely. We can build up proper strength. You know, we talk about we shouldn't be walking proper, we shouldn't be walking badly, we should always be walking properly, yet we won't do a tendon lengthening operation, but will allow that so they're always walking with bad movement patterns. But actually, if we did the tendon lengthening, sometimes we can then work on the neural part as well as the strength part and get them to walk properly. And it's this whole balance off, isn't it? And, and Yeah, yeah. I, 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 totally I think agree. the UK has done really well, but I do see a difference. Yeah, I, I, I'm completely on the same side with you on this. Like, yeah, the amount of times, you know, I would push for tendon lengthening or, or whatever, even just whatever they might need, actually, for me. And uh, and it would be like, oh, you know, we'll wait and see a little bit longer. We're not really sure quite yet. And, and you can see it already happening. And that's frustrating. But also, I also feel that I don't I don't know if you agree with this, but. Um, as people because we have the NHS 
if the NHS says no, then it's definitely not the right thing to do. And in actual fact, that might not be true. Or there might be an operation so that could be done, but the NHS doesn't. It's not done on the NHS, and that's why they say no. Does that make sense? Have I kind of got across? Uh, 100%. So here's a question for you. Have you ever bumped your car, written off a vehicle, or anything like that in the whole lifetime of you driving? <laughs> yes, I have. I have done a okay. bump and okay, a written so off. Okay, so you bumped your car or whatever. <laughs> okay. Why did it get written off? Because the insurance company found that fixing the car was more expensive than writing it off and giving you a check, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Look at America, for instance, it's all driven by insurance. The insurance pays, the insurance does that. If it doesn't work, the insurance wouldn't be offering that service, right? Because let's be fair, the insurance company sure as heck don't want to pay out for something. So if they offer something, they've got the factual proof, all the evidence in there to say that it works, right? There is 379 million people that live in America. There is something like 700 million that live in Europe. Out of those 379 million people that live in America, all the insurance companies talk about things that work, that don't work, that they'll pay for, that they won't pay for, that they've seen has an effect, that see that doesn't have an effect. All of those things. So if the insurance company turn around and say, this operation works and we'll pay for it, it's because they've got the scientific evidence and the factual points there to say that it works, right? Yeah. The insurance companies don't want to pay out for something. Let's be fair. That's why they write your car off because it works out that it's five pounds cheaper to write your car off than give you that I five so. pounds, right? Yeah. Even though it's a pain in the boot to you, that's what they'll do. But the point being on that is that the NHS isn't quite like that. It's so underfunded. Everybody in the NHS does an amazing job with virtually no money to run the NHS. The yeah. hospitals in America are bigger. They have more. They pay their salaries way more than what they pay here because the insurance companies are driven that whole process around. If they turn around and the insurance companies say, yes, the, the SPML, yes, the perks, yes, the SDR work. It does the job it's supposed to do. The doctor and consultants say that it works, it does the job. It's because it works. And the argument to that is it's because there's research there to prove it. And unfortunately, I find that in the UK, it's not always like that. And I'm sure it's the same in other places, but in mm -hmm. the UK, it's not always like that because we have the NHS that we rely so heavily on, but we're basing that on 60 million people. Now, Texas has got 27 million people just in Texas. And there's 379 that live in America. So they've got more knowledge, more experience, more things to pull from. I'm not saying it's all better in America, far from it. But they have got a lot more information that they can pull from and draw from. And I feel that sometimes the UK is not using that um, and not pulling global research sometimes to get the results. And we get stuck in our ways. We know what we're like in the yeah. UK. I am too. <laughs> um, and if it hasn't worked before, it's not going to work now. We have that mentality. And I, I'm not poo-pooing the UK, by the way. I, I, I think the surgery, I think the surgeons, I think the physios, I think the staff, everybody that works is amazing. And I think we all do a big part of it. But it does frustrate me that it, it, it's so different from what they'd offer somewhere else. And, and the, even in different areas, it's so very different. But yeah. There is a huge amount of where you go back and you say, I think this child could benefit from um, being sent a review to Dr. Dobbs, for instance, um, or Dr. Park. UK said, no, we wouldn't do the operations. Dobbs and Park come back and say, yeah, absolutely, we would do the operations based on X, Y, and Z. And that's X, Y, and Z's worth of knowledge, experience, and, and doing it. It's just a little bit different sometimes. Um, yeah. And yeah. it's a hard one to quantify. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so God, I'm going to get slated for this, aren't I? <laughs> no, no. I, I, do you know what? It's, it's a really hard... Uh, I remember when I first started Disable the Label, I had somebody from the NHS message me to say, you're not going to poo-poo the NHS, are you? I, 
no, no, I'm not. But I'm going to be factual and say that there are things that can help kids that aren't on NHS. Conductive education is one. Your strength and conditioning is another one. That's just two things just to prove. They both work. And just because they're not on the NHS doesn't mean that they don't work, doesn't mean you shouldn't be paying privately. And I think also people feel that they shouldn't have to pay for those privately. And and it's just that's the NHS doesn't have the money and the capability to do all those things that is actually needed for those children. Um, and, you know, and that is, that's the reason why then the it's totally different here having SDR to in the US. That's just a fact. Um, so I'm totally with you on that one. Um, anyway (laughs) let's not let's not continue on that let's um what advice would you give to parents that would be looking into sdr at the moment for example try any therapy that you can get your hands on every therapist every company likes to turn around and say to you that the therapy is the best or it, it it does everything you don't need to go anywhere else it's not true um i've been doing this a long time I do massage therapy, I do dry needling, I do cupping, we do um, rehab and recovery, we do strength and conditioning, we do a a DMI, CMI type therapy, we do, you know, I'm looking at my gym, I've got Hypervive, I've got ski arts, I've got lifting platforms, I've got hand bikes, I've got pretty much everything that you could possibly want to use, we've got it in here. Um, And I use all of them and sometimes none of them. And not every therapy is going to work for you. Not every therapist is going to work for you. For instance, myself, some people love me, some people hate me, some people loathe me, and some people <laughs> will travel around the world to find me. And that's okay. I'm not for everybody. We're Marmite sometimes, and that's okay. But that doesn't mean that the person's wrong. And it doesn't mean that the, that, that the parent is wrong. It, my therapy, for instance, is is kind of tough, um, and I don't make excuses for that. We do push for results, and we should, because I believe that as a trainer, we have a right to push somebody for their ability. And I don't mean that as in we have the right. We have to be. I mean, we're being paid for results, regardless of anything else. This is a result-driven business, right? If you're coming to me because there's nothing else. I'm not interested as a person in doing that. I don't want people to come to me because there's nothing else to go to. I want people to come to me because they feel that I've got the skill set that they're needing just now to achieve their results. That's what I'm looking for. Now, I've worked with kids that are eight months old all the way up to adults that are 44 and and 50 beyond, not just from a strength and conditioning perspective, but also as a a rehab therapist, but also as a, a therapist for disabled children and adults. There isn't one encompassing therapy that does it all. You know, I I quite like NAPA and I quite like the NAPA base. I like conductive education. I like physical therapy. I like strength and conditioning. I like, um, there's one in Oxford, I've forgotten their names, footsteps. I like footsteps. But I don't think that the, the Adeli suit is right for everybody. I don't think that the spider cage is right for everybody. I don't think the spider cage is great post SDR on a more ambulatory child because we're not moving in and out of ranges of movements very well. We tend to hold into a static range, but there's aspects of it that are also very, very good. And I think what happens is we get caught on a technique and a model and a theory and not based on what the person needs. So a lot of them, they use a lot of modalities to do what they want to do. Sometimes we need to not stick to, we do an hour of this, an hour of that, and an hour of that. That's just what we do. That's how we work. We need to look at the individual and, and, and work what they need. And that could be two hours of floor work and no deli suit, or two hours of a deli suit and no floor work, or whatever. But it has to be specific to them. Mm-hmm. And Napa's model is really good. It, it's, it is very good. Um, but there's also other things that work really well as well, like strength and conditioning that we do, the movement-based therapy that we do, and other places do as well, also works very, very well. And actually, a lot of the time, it's not just a, just go to this therapy center or just go to that therapist. Sometimes you need to combine them because you take the best from them and the best from them, 
and you're joining them together by yeah. combining the therapies. So one of the things I tell all I my totally clients agree. is don't stick to one modality, stick to trying everything, but give something long enough to work. So for instance, don't go to this therapist for five minutes and say that didn't work, you know, or that therapist and say that didn't work. You've got you to gotta give it enough time and try. I've got clients that go to Napa, I've got clients that go to Footsteps, and I've got clients that come to me. And the reason they go to all three is we all offer something very, very different. And sometimes what yeah. we offer, the differences, is actually the shortfallings in each clinic. Not because it's a shortfalling and they can't do it, but because it's not their gift. It's not what they want to focus on. If I've got somebody that's going to DMI therapy, I'm probably not going to do a lot of DMI therapy in my training or CME training or the type of training that they do. I'm not going to, I'm not going to integrate that in because they're already doing a lot of that. I'm going to look at what they're not getting and try and maximize it from there. I also find that working on the psychology of the training is a huge part and that's something that we focus on a lot and that is pushing you to be more, to allow you to fail, to allow you to make mistakes and allowing the kids to understand that just because you failed today doesn't mean that you're a failure, that it's just a lesson that you've got to learn and that we've got to learn how to fail, not achieve something because we do spend a lot of time trying to tell our kids they're amazing just because their hair grows. And that's not right either. They're not learning anything from that. So what I try and do is I try and set them tasks that are hard, that they have to then learn how to do it, make a mistake, teach the mistake, overcome the mistake, learn that training, time, and perseverance will get you to the next level. And then that also builds up strength, not just strength and muscles, strength and movement patterns, but also emotional and uh, mental strength. And I think these kids' life is going to be harder. No, no matter what we say and what we do, their life is more complicated, whether that be in a wheelchair, walkers, sticks, whether that be at school, whether that mm. be in jobs. But we have to learn that we can do more than the sum of our parts. I couldn't read until I was 15. I'm chronically dyslexic. I've done okay with myself because I tried really hard and I worked really hard and I pushed myself really, really hard. The downside is if we're not learning those lessons, we are not really learning how to be a functional member of society. And these kids have to be the same as everybody else. So I'm a big believer in try every therapy that you can possibly get your hands on Go to any therapy you can possibly do. Try everything, ask anything, disagree with everything, argue everything, but at least give it a go. Um, don't say yeah. it's not going to work because somebody said it didn't work for them. Um, you know, there's loads of clients I've worked with that I that dislike me, and that's okay. But 90% of the people that, that dislike me will still turn around and say that his therapy is good and he does get results, but he does push the kids. And I do, and all those points are true. But that doesn't mean that the parents necessarily like me or the kids necessarily like me. They don't always, but I am good at my job. And sometimes they need a little bit of that along with that little bit of nurture as well. They need that, you, you need everything yeah. coming into the mix together. You don't make a cake just with flour. You have to add the eggs, you have to add the sugar, you have to add the, a little bit of water or milk or whatever, a bit of chocolate powder if you want something different, you know. And then you have to mix it up and then you, you, you bake it and you've got a nice cake. And that's what this has to be. It has to be find the bits that you're missing to create what you want. But however much money, as you said, you think you need, it's always going to be more. Yep. That is, like, massive. I, I totally agree. Multi different team members you know to that child is key the kids that I've worked with that have had the best results have that uh, obviously Jemima being one of them um and they worked with what she needed like and they recognized during COVID for example hydrotherapy was one of the things that she needed to help her body just to kind of relax and get into good positions again and so they they 
ran with that and went and find a private hydrotherapist as well as having me as well as having you you know like as well as having a private physio as well as having physio at school and we all worked as a, as a you know everyone's working on the things that they multi team exactly and and that's the the kids that i've worked with that have had that have got 100 percent the best results and also um I've seen them change as kids in the greatest way. Jemima is one of the people that I've seen, like, I don't know whether she did this with you. Probably she wouldn't dare. But she she used to say to me, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. And I would, I ended up yep, banning the that. word within our session. <laughs> yeah. I was like, no, that word is banned. The next moment you say that, I'm walking out and I'm leaving and I'm not working with you anymore. So she stopped saying it. And we had, um, must have been in 20... 17 or 2018 I did like a fundraising walk with the kids they had to walk it themselves and she did amazing and I was so proud of her and at the end she said I'm tired and Joe and I turn around to her and say yes you're correct you are tired you've just walked nearly 2k and you've done an amazing job and this is what tired feels like so when you're in a session with either Kerry or Mike and you think that you're tired remember this moment because this is actually what tired feels like and that was I felt like that was a ter- massive turning point for her because she wouldn't say that then to me afterwards the session because she realized what tired actually meant and felt like because she hadn't known what it felt like before and she's changed dramatically I remember she used to be like oh I'm going to see Mike he's gonna he's gonna be so mean to me and then now he's like she's like oh Mike's great he was really great this this time I'm like god can you speak to the younger child of you because that's totally different (laughs) you know know. but it just shows like you know what you, you learn that it's massive, absolutely massive for for every child. Every child is learning from the people that they're working with and she's learned like thousand things from you, clearly. And also I gave her that little bit of a different... I was harsh with her, like she would not... You did more than a little bit. I said to you. You know, <laughs> you did a lot. I mean, but, you, it, know, it, you can't do... She, you, she had every more of a piece caring. has to combine, right? Totally. I, I, I just think I was... I, I did it very differently to you because that's the way I work. I work differently, but it doesn't mean I wasn't harsh, but in my own way, I, I think I think she she kind of knows that with me now. And um, I even over here in Morocco, like some a child was crying at the back of the van one day and Dwayne, Dwayne just turned to me and said, well, if you don't care if Jemima cries, you're definitely not going to care if that child cries. And I was like, yeah, most 100%. Because Jemima could cry in front of me and unless she was actually ill and something was actually wrong you're no we're not i'm not doing that with you and 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 i had the backup of joe just like she would back you up as well like joe, it, it's that's a oh massive God, thing parent support is your massive. if you can get the parents on board yeah game changer if the parents are on board and they're like yeah. if, and i make a point of trying to explain so much to the parents so i do quite a lot of talking clearly i mean and and mm. i do like to explain a lot so this is happening, that's happening, it's uncomfortable, it's this, it's that, you know, they are going to feel this, they are going to feel that, you know, that is going to happen, that's going to happen. And if you can get the parents on board and get them to understand and get them to do the therapy at home, and get them, and that's a key one, is doing the therapy at home, getting them to just do those little bits. Yeah. They can see themselves that it's tough. And sometimes they'll get the parents in doing the exercises as well and be like, you know, one of the things that gets me sometimes when the parent goes, come on, you can do better than that. And I'm like, come and take a seat. Come and take a seat. Have a go. Let's, let's you do it now. Yeah. Bear in mind, they're lifting a five kilo med ball and they only weigh in at 30 kilos. So, I mean, yeah. it's quite a bit of their body weight. So let's get you doing the same with a 15 kilo <laughs> med ball and you do the same sets as what they're doing. Let's see how what you're doing. And I'm like, come on, get on with it. And they're like, damn, that's hard. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. Yeah. So when I'm giving that kid the break, I'm giving them the break so mentally they can recover, physically they can recover. We can give them some food. I and mean, it's also our way of saying and acknowledging they've worked hard. So good job. So please don't turn yeah. out and say you can do better because you can't yourself. So, and then you can sort of see their brain being like, damn. My mother's an interesting one, though. Um, she was quite kyphotic and scoliotic and Joe won't mind me saying um, mm. but we used a lot of needles cupping and a lot of soft tissue work on her 
to get her back into a more normal position. And her curves yeah. had reduced, I think it was something silly, like like 20%, 10% reduction in curves just yeah. by using and allowing Don't... the muscle to actually open and elongate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think even I saw that so, from whenever she would go to you and then I would see her then that following week. She'd be just totally different. And uh, Joe texted me recently about the dramatic change in, in, in those. And it, it's just amazing. It just does show. And I think and she's she's one child that a lot, of, I don't know whether you agree, but I feel like some, she would go into some therapist and they'd be like, okay. Um, and they wouldn't be trying to improve that. They wouldn't be working out the ways to do that. Obviously, I don't have those skills, so I can't do that. But I, I think that's really key that you, you know, you've been able to sh show that and and change that for her because it wasn't a, for her. It wasn't about now like walking. It's not about walking independently. Joe knows she's not going to do that. It's about getting her body to be functioning in the way that she needs it to be functioning, and that is a massive part. And not be in pain, right? Uh, yeah, like I was just about to say, like she's uncomfortable otherwise, you know. And I and I would have these discussions with her. She would, you know, between sets, she would always be like, "Oh, you know, my back was hurting at school today." And I would always wonder, like, and I always mentioned to Joe, like the different chairs that she was in or whatever. And and then we discussed that actually recently when I was with them in Fortaventura. But um, when we were discussing the dry needling and and the cupping, and I was like, I just I wish we'd like figured that out sooner in some ways like and and it's crazy how much I wish I had as well she, she is in herself yeah and it, it but it's 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 a learning thing isn't it again like she we now know what it is and and that is massively changing her life and her comfort of her life because you know then she's going to be happier and not be moaning all the time <laughs> well I mean I so, I did the I did try need like years ago and and did massage therapy years ago and I've always asked uh, integrated massage into the the courses and rehabbed into the courses and from cupping into it um, but it was actually COVID times I realized there was something in my therapy that I was really missing out and it wasn't right and I had time so I went away and did this level five in soft tissue therapy with um, the Oxford School of Sports Massage it was a great course um, you know and I'm going there with quite a lot of um, experience and qualifications already and I thought if I learn 10% from the course or 20% in the course if it reiterates my my knowledge on muscles and bones and joints then and I get to restudy the things I haven't done for 15 or 20 years then you know this is going to be great and I did I learned a lot and the lecturers were brilliant but what I learned was how to use the knowledge from that in my course it got me thinking about how i could change my therapy to be different and how i could use different modalities to kind of help the kids in a different way and i think that comes back to the point of where we say try anything and everything and it's your therapist mm -hmm. should also be trying anything and trying everything and not just sitting in the, the rhythm of where they're happy and they should also be looking to re-educate themselves and not just because they did a course 22 years ago be happy that they know it all because actually you then need to reiterate you forget more than you remember because your your knowledge becomes very specific and honed so i make a point now of, of working on athletes um, i do 15 hours a week to 20 hours a week of massage injury rehab needling cupping on athletes and general public because they can tell me where they're hurting they can show me where they're hurting i can feel it yeah. i remember it and then when i feel it on a kid i can be like they might not be able to articulate what sore or when or how or why, but I can feel it and go, that's a little bit sore. That's got to be uncomfortable there. Let's do a little mm -hmm. bit of massage or stretching or change my strengthening to be this way so it strengthens the opposing side, which you would try and do anyway. But when you start to do more massage and therapies like that that are a bit more hands-on and specific, you open up the muscle and then you strengthen the opposite side. And by strengthening this side, you're already lengthening this side. But if you do a soft tissue release on this side that's really, really tight in, say, the QL, for instance, it allows you to engage more mm -hmm. glute and QL on the opposite side. So you can actually start to get their hips to line up better just by doing that. Sometimes 
massaging the hamstrings out because they're super tight, dry needling them, increasing the range. We sometimes increase the range by 30 degrees on the hamstrings um, or the pop angle. So you're increasing that range and then getting them to do standing and balancing and walking. You're stretching it out more. You're teaching the body how to engage the muscles. So now you, what you're getting is the understanding of reciprocal inhibition. You've changed the neurological part. So the Golgi tendon organ doesn't stop the muscles from moving. You've opened it up, you've allowed the muscle to actually fully engage, you're increasing range of movement and you're teaching the kids that they can use this range now and it becomes the new norm. Um, and then you just maintain that and keep it going. And that's what we try and do with the kids. It's fascinating. But on kids like mine, yeah. who've got scoliosis and kyphosis, the muscles start to get tight around that as well. So by opening that up and elongating and stretching and opening and moving and then working on core work, stretching arms out, stretching legs out, it does have a long-term effect, um, but you've got to have a kid and a parent willing enough to go with your what seems like a fairly crazy idea. Um, <laughs> and, you know, our clients tend to be pretty up for some crazy stuff because they've seen the crazy yeah. work. And actually, it's not always that crazy. It, there is a science base behind it. It just hasn't been applied to this exact thing before. but. The theories work, it yeah. just hasn't been applied to this thing. So once you get there, it's, it's not that It's bad. just not the norm. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's not what you would recognise as n normal use of it. And that's why it's it's something that we're not used to. And that's why it, it's so like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, go go ahead and see, what, see, you know, see if it works. And actually, yeah, like you said, it's going to. Um Okay, uh, yeah, last question. It, it's those things like that that are a key. Sorry. Yeah, 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 totally. It's all right. Um, <laughs> so what advice would you give to kids that um, are going for SDR or have done or are thinking about it or just doing training and have cerebral palsy and want to improve themselves? It's a, that's a fantastic question, and I have never been asked that. Um, but something that I tell all my kids is don't train because you've got a disability. Um, you can't make your training about having CP. If you're going to train, train because you want to enjoy it. Train because you want to do a sport. Train because you want to do an activity. Train because of something else. Don't just train because you've got CP. Don't. Don't make your disability the reason that you do something. For sure, you're going to train because you want you want to improve your walking. Or, but you've also got to enjoy it. You've also got to get something out of it. Um, I train now. I I I I still train like I'm playing sport to a high level, and the reason for it is because I love it. And there comes a point, and it's one of the things I see is that. My kids, and you'll probably see the same, hit sort of 12 and can't be bothered because they've done 12 years worth of therapy. Yeah. And there's no reason behind it. They're sick of it. They're sick of, of learning to walk. Arguably, sometimes that's because they've never seen results in that time because the therapist is keeping them within comfort zones or parents are or parents are not expecting them to improve yeah. or pushing them to improve or teaching them to improve. And that's parents, coaches, everybody. Sometimes we need that coach to be a bit of an asshole and be the thing that that kid needs, and that is to push them beyond their comfort zone and say, no, we're going to do this today, and then they see a result and they start to get a thrive off it. That's exactly the mentality of being an athlete. It's that time, I, I remember playing water polo and carrying buckets of water. I was a goalkeeper. I was playing for, I can't remember if it's Scotland or Great Britain, but my coach, a guy called Brian Littlejohn, and, you know, I'm carrying this bucket of water across the pool like this, and, and I'm getting to the other end, and he's like, good, that was really good, well done, and then takes another scoop and puts more water in it and goes, go back again, and I'm like, oh my God. So I'm going back, and I'm like, <laughs> now instead of sitting like here out the water, I'm sitting like here, and I'm like, oh my god! And I get to the other end, I put the bucket up, and he's like, oh, that was good, well done. One length up and down, stretched off, grabbed the bucket again. He's like, another scoop of water, and I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, 
while you were still breathing. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And it made me, that training made me such a good goalkeeper because my legs got stronger, my cardio got stronger, my ability got more. So it became easier to do everything that I wanted to do, right? But the problem is, is that at some point in time, the kids aren't going to want to do therapy anymore because they're doing therapy because they've got CP. They're going to get irritated, bored, and annoyed with CP, right? And it's going to happen faster if they're not seeing results, right? So what I would say to anybody thinking of SDR, having SDR, getting their kids into SDR, is just like any therapy, get them into any sport. And let them lose. Let them get rough and tumbled, a little bit of hurt, get them into martial arts, get them into rock climbing, get them into swimming, get them into water polo, get them into horse riding, not just hypotherapy, get them into CrossFit, get them into anything that they can possibly do where they're competing against anyone with a disability or neurotypical, I don't care. Get them into a sport and get them doing something so they're training not just to be better at walking or moving, but better because they enjoy sport and activity. That's how we keep somebody fit and healthy for life, not just doing it because they've got CP or they've got a neural problem or they've got um, a disability. If you train because you love it, you'll train your entire life. If you train because you want to learn to walk, what do you do after you've learned to walk? Because that's been your goal for X amount of years. Well, if you achieve your goal, then what? You come up with a new goal. I want to learn to run. Okay, that's my next goal. It's hard to get to that. It's difficult to get there. It will hit a point in their life where they can't be bothered training because they haven't seen results or they're just sick of training. But if you get them into an activity, into a sport, yeah. cycling, rowing, rowing's brilliant. And that totally works for CP. You know, that really good grip for their arms, that good strength you know, core stability. Get them into doing sports because then it's something that will last forever as opposed to, we, and it's something I have seen, kids that we've taught to walk, to move, to balance, they lose a little bit of their uh, walking ability as they get older because they stop training. And as they stop training, they stop walking as well. It does go backwards a little bit and that's unfortunate. But if they'd kept up with a sport, they'd be training for the sport and the activity, not just because they've got CP. And then you don't feel like you're doing it because you're, you, you've, you've got a disability. You just feel that you're training. And it's a really great way of meeting people socially. I love motorsports. As everybody that knows me knows, I love racing motorbikes. But I also love martial arts, and I've been doing it since I was five. I loved water polo and played it to Scotland and Great Britain level. I, I loved it. And I absolutely loved competing at whatever level I could possibly compete at. I loved playing rugby. I loved anything that was difficult, challenging, hard. And I would get the kids into anything that they possibly can. Because if not, they're probably going to stop early on. So, I don't know if Mike's going to come back, but um, that was an amazing chat with him. Um, and I'm really grateful that he came on the podcast and chatted um, with me about everything, all of his experience, his knowledge. He is a font of knowledge. If you want to find and speak to Mike, um, he is available to speak to anybody you can contact him at walk this way oxford um he is on instagram and he is on facebook i will link everything in the description below and um you can also find him via his website i think so all of that will be in the description in the podcast so thank you very much and i hope you enjoyed it Thanks for tuning in to the Disable the Label podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a comment to let us know what you thought of this episode. More episodes will be coming soon, so make sure you tune in. Don't forget you can download our app for free via the App Store. That's Google Play or Apple App Store. Just search Disable the Label and you'll find us.